Thank you, Sindhu, for that lovely introduction. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for allowing me to speak today. So the topics that I'll be covering include some background information on precision medicine for cancer. Um, I'm then going to speak about our efforts to apply um, precision medicine methodology to acute myeloid leukemia, or AML, multiple myeloma, chronic myelogenous leukemia, or CML, and to other cancers. And a new twist that we have is, the, is on, uh, regarding leukemia stem cells, and we'll be adding um, testing regarding those in our next generation of clinical trials. These are my disclosures, um, including uh, grants to the University of Washington from pharmaceutical companies. So in January 2015, at the State of the Union address, um, the President Obama, um, at the time, gave a mandate to, um, for this precision medicine initiative. The mission statement was to enable a new era of medicine through research technology and policies that empower patients, researchers, and providers to work together toward development of individualized care. So why precision medicine? Um, the rationale is that um, if we knew that cancer had a specific mutation that dominated its um, uh, survival, then the idea would be that we could target that cancer with something that would treat just that mutation, and it would be the optimal intervention. We wouldn't have insufficient intervention, which would be wasteful because we wouldn't be sufficiently treating that cancer, or excessive intervention that might lead to um, a lot of morbidity and toxicity of treatment. The traditional precision medicine would be, for cancer, would be that we identify a mutation and a targeted inhibitor is given. So a great example would be to give Gleevec um, or imatinib for chronic myelogenous leukemia. And there's a trial that's been ongoing now for a couple of years, the National Cancer Institute MATCH trial. MATCH stands for Molecular Analysis for Therapy Choice. And um, patients are, there's a list that I'll show you in the next slide of the different um, mutations that they test for and different drugs that they have for those. And this type of trial is called a basket trial or a bucket trial or an umbrella trial. So here's the example of the different mutations that are, these are the different arms of the trial, and these are the mutations that they're um, doing next-gen sequencing for. And then if a patient with any cancer has this mutation, they can get this drug, et cetera. This has gone on for all these different arms. But the pro there's a lot of problems that arise with this approach. One is that we don't have enough drugs. So we don't have enough targeted agents for all the mutations that we find in cancer. In fact, there's you know, it's very few. Um, and then, there's, so there's too few patients that have those mutations. So for example, with the NCI MATCH trial, um, at the time they opened, they had 18 mutations and 12 drugs. And in June of 2017, they, they enrolled 6,398 patients. They had, um, there were sites across the country, over 100 different sites that had opened. Um, and they found 983 patients who had those mutations, but by the time they were ready to be treated, only 660 still, still met the criteria. So only 10% of the patients got treated. So it's just far too few. 90% never got a drug, which is, uh, seems um, like, like that was wasteful. <laughs> um, and then the second problem is a huge problem, which is the chosen inhibitor doesn't work all the time. Um, so, for example, um, ARMW, which offers a drug for an FGFR mutation, they had 1.3% um, of the patients who, who underwent successful sequencing had that mutation. 7.5% of the patients who enrolled in all the treatment arms um, were, were, received the drug, and so 50 patients were treated, but only two partial responses were the best responses. And six-month progression-free survival was only 17%. Um, arm I, um, this was just presented at, at the American Society for Clinical Oncology meeting um, <clears throat> last year. And for arm I, this telelisib was given for this mutation to 65 patients, and there were no responses. 
Um, and they report this six-month progression-free survival of 27%. So it's hard to know that we've made any impact with no responses or two partial responses after trying to give the drugs, the, the wonder drugs that we're supposed to um, help. So um, they also, in this, in this arm, they found that there were co-occurring mutations in 67% of tumors. So it turns out that, that cancers have hundreds of mutations. So the idea that we target the one that we have a drug for and think that we're going to make an impact is probably too, far too simple. So the focus on, on these mutations may be too narrow. <clears throat> so there's been some advances in terms of the way the Food and Drug Administration is looking at at mutation testing, and in fact, um, so there's a, about a dozen tests that are FDA approved for, di for different mutations, and they just now um, approved the first panel, um, the um, Foundation One Companion Diagnostic, which is a panel of mutations, and the um, Center for Medicare Services um, approved um, payment for that test, and um, this was a first where actual panel was approved for testing for all of these different types of cancers, coverage across all solid tumors, and even for repeat testing. So this is a first, and this just um, happened fairly recently. In addition, um, the Food and Drug Administration is also now thinking out of the box, not just from a diagnostic um, perspective, but also from a therapeutic perspective. So instead of approving a drug just for one type of cancer, which was the traditional way, they approved a drug based on the basket trials for solid tumors with the NTRAC gene fusions, um, and they call this tissue agnostic treatment strategy. And it was based on several phase one, two trials. Um, and here's another example of where a drug was approved as a result of a basket trial showing the application for a BRAF mutation in another condition. But there are limitations to genomics, um, and I've already described the, the fact that we only have targeted drugs for certain mutations and specific cancer types, and this issue of multiple mutations in each cancer. We don't know, we're looking for the domino or the Achilles here. We're, look, we're looking for the one that to which all the rest of them would, that, that the proliferation and, and existence of that tumor would succumb, and we don't know what, which one that is. Um, also, um, genomic instability can give rise to clonal heterogeneity, so that treatment may impose selective pressure, and then new resistant subclones arise. So even if we had one that was effective, it soon might become ineffective. Um, there's, there's not only um, mutations, um, it would be you know, somewhere in the genetics and genomics of the tumors, but then there's um, gene expression and translation that can all ultimately determine the phenotype and susceptibility to drugs. Um, there's acquisition of drug resistance because there could be additional mutations such as in the active site that, to which the drug binds, or there can be an active membrane pump to exclude the drug entry or into the cell, or there can be excessive metabolism of the drug. And so there's a lot of ways in which um, finding mutation may not be sufficient. And um, in fact, um, <clears throat> I see that uh, um, Dr. Larry Loeb is here, and we um, had um, worked on this question of, of um, could we see clonal evolution? So we had a patient with AML that was treated, and we saw that a diagnosis, um, an NRAS mutation was present in 0.8% of the cells, and then when the patient relapsed after the, that initial period of treatment, that NRAS mutation, which is usually confers high resistance, um, is now 37% of the cells. So you're dealing with a completely different uh, cancer by the time relapse occurs. So this, this also, if, you've got a moving, if you have a moving target, then how will you ever be able to just use mutations? So um, my rationale for turning to functional screening was that in reality, the patients were succumbing to cancers after failing first and second line therapies and conventional clinical trials, and that these phase one trials, they start to test drugs at concentrations that are below the level needed for efficacy, a tenth or a hundredth of the, of the um, concentration or of the drug um, dosing that's needed for efficacy. And the primary goal for those phase one trials is safety. And that's the only thing we have for the patients. So once they fail the, the usual treatment, and then they go fail clinical trials, the um, early, um, only early phase, phase one trials are, are offered, and the chances that someone's gonna respond to those is very low. But what if we could test each patient's cancer cells and then treat according to those individual vulnerabilities that we proved in the laboratory? 
And this is, is widely accepted, of course. We're, we're doing antibiotic susceptibility testing and we have been doing that for um, decades and everybody gets it that you know you plate your bacteria and you um, put on your antibiotic discs and, you, and we, we're, we accept this readily and yet we don't even think to do this for cancers. So, um, so th this goes back to why have these in vitro testing assays failed in cancer? Um, so, and I think they go back for some time, um, probably at least the 70s, um, um, that patient, the cells were tested in suspension cultures. And, um, and the problem is, is that in vivo, there's environment-mediated chemotherapy resistance. Um, so for example, we know that when cells are adherent um, to extracellular matrix proteins or to um, stromal cells, that they're resistant to chemotherapy. Um, there's issues about the drug concentrations that we give in, in vitro versus the achievable drug concentrations in, in, vi in vivo. Um, in vivo, there has to be drug delivery to the entire um, body of tumor cells, which could be in um, protected environments, like the spinal fluid, for example. Um, in vivo drug metabolism, so the, the liver and, and the kidney are there that could clear or metabolize the drug. Um, and then there's this issue of three dimension versus two dimension versus three dimensional and fluidics and um, exposure of the cells to the vasculature. And uh, for this reason, I have a collaboration now with um, a bioengineer in uh, my building to try to mimic better in three dimensions. In addition, we need drug combinations. So all this individual drug testing is unlikely to ultimately um, prove successful. So what we did was we tried to mimic the microenvironment with extracellular matrix proteins and pro um, protein combinations. And that's the one of the innovations in our assay. So um, when we started the assay, assay um, development, we looked at different plates. So that's a simple question. If you're going to do high throughput screening and you're doing them in 384 well plates, which plates should you use? So if we coded matrix proteins, we found um, on, on uh, non-tissue culture plates, we found that we had nice distribution of the cells without any clumping. Whereas if we used the poly-D lysine pre-coded plate, we got these big um, clumpy things, and that, of course, is going to lead to issues with um, perhaps with diffusion of drugs, so that doesn't look good. And then if we did the this um, amine pure coat plate, again, the same problem. We had even bigger clumps, huge we got tumors growing, and again, I think we, we were concerned that would cause this um, dif uh, diffusion issues of drug access. So we went with the matrix coated plate the first um, ones. And then the question is, what would happen to viability, to cell viability? So that was other, another huge problem. Like if you start to c call the places across the country who are doing these assays and they'll say, oh, we can't ever, we're never successful if we thaw cryopreserved cells. It never works. Well, in my lab, it always works So because we have SOPs to optimize that. Um, they say that the cells die during the time of the assay. So typically you add the drugs for 72 hours and we have no problem with that either. And I think that par part of that is this. So you see if you, this was um, extracellular matrix coded versus poly-D lysine. And this is the luminescence reading, which is showing um, cell viability. So you see that on this extracellular matrix coded plate that there's the same cell viability um, this was across the different concentrations per well, cell concentrations per well. But with the polydelysine coated plates, you've got, you know, this is, these are percent survival. So by, um, you know, these higher concentrations, you're down to only 50% cell viability at 72 hours. So you don't want all these dead cells there. That's going to confound your results. So, um, so anyway, so we went through all this testing to try to develop um, the assay. And this is what we came up with eventually. And this was, uh, we all started this about nine or 10 years ago. So we did an inherent assay to mimic adhesion-mediated chemotherapy resistance, which is present in the marrow. Um, our test is clear approved, has been for four years. Um, we had um, our, our current AML and ALL panel has 153 drugs and drug combinations, and I'll show you other panels have other numbers of drugs. We use eight different concentrations of, dr um, of drug that span four logs, and they're custom for each drug. So each of the 150 
three drugs has its own custom concentrations. Um, we uh, look at viability using cell titer glow, which um, measures um, ATP at 72 hours. And we then um, calculate IC or EC50 values by fitting data using least squares method to a, um, a standard four parameter logistic model. Excel fit is an add in into Excel, and that's how we do the um, modeling. We barcode, so then we have all the other issues that come into CLIA. I see. Um, Dan Sabbath is here, and before we went to Clea, we asked for his advice. So, um, so anyway, so we have all of our plates are barcoded, and I can see them here. Um, and this is some of our um, screening core instrumentation. We have um, these liquid handlers, and we have. Um, uh, well, it's hard to see here. So our, our drugs are added using these um, very fine pins is how they're added. Um, I've got some other views. Um, this is, um, so we have um, the channel dispensers. Um, so we're adding um, uh, different volumes. And we have the capability of using many different wells, but we found that our best results are with the 3D4 well plates. So that's what we stuck to. Um, and here you can see in the central area, this is where the, um, the different additions um, happen. And w we've moved to where almost everything is done robotically now. So the entire setup is all done robotically. Um, our viability assay I mentioned was this Promega cell titer glow. Um, it's, uh, we just add the reagent that lyses the cells and then, um, then the uh, luciferase, so we have a luminescence, a bioluminescence that's quantified on this um, Perkin Elmer Envision plate reader, reader. So there's like a large stack of all the plates, and they're red. And here we um, is an example showing the wells, um, and blue is dead, and red is alive, and um, the other different colors are mostly dead cells. And so we get these, um, we get a readout of, from the plates. Um, and this is, uh, these are very early data. So this is just um, for 30 patients worth of data. So there's, um, so each of these has um, six patients in, on each of these graphs. And there's different colors for every patient. And what you can see is that this is um, a drug to which almost all the patients are resistant. And as you can see, there's 100% survival, or even they're even growing. <laughs> Likely, um, we're at over 100% um, where, the, where there's higher cell numbers. And so the, the, this drug doesn't work. And this drug works, but you can see it variably works. So to the left is more sensitive, a lower concentration. This is 10 to the minus 10th molar. Here it's 10 to the minus 5th molar. And you can see that um, there's a distribution amongst all the patients. So variable sensitivity, but um, to this drug. So this is a drug to which all patients are sensitive. So that's just to orient you. So early on, we were trying to figure out, can we really do this to patients and actually choose drugs based on this? And we were quite frightened and concerned that how do we know that there could be clinical benefit? So when, one thing that we did was we looked and we took the patients that uh, out of our 30 test subjects who achieved a complete remission with a clinical regimen, and we asked whether the patients that achieved a clinical response, uh, CR, to their regimen versus those that did not achieve CR, could we see any difference in the um, activity of any of the drugs in, ter in terms of the um, results with drugs? And out of those 153 drugs, or 160 drugs, I think we had at the time, um, we found that the drugs that we often used in AML, we used clofarabine, we used mitoxantrum, we used we use Atra, we use Clandrobene, we use Donorubicin. These are drugs we use constantly. And we saw that the p-values were significant, indicating that there was a difference. So that was our first signal that maybe this actually would have clinical relevance, that our in vitro testing was actually, we were plopping out the drugs that actually we're using in AML. <clears throat> so, and then we also um, looked at, um, with hierarchical clusterings. Um, so each of these um, is a different, uh, patient or cell line in each row. And um, these are the different drugs. And you can see that all these drugs are all FLT3 inhibitors. And um, all these drugs are MEK inhibitors. And so, and then you know, these other drugs also, so they're all the same, like these drugs across are all the same. And what we're seeing is that for, for these drugs, these patients 
um, are all sensitive, and these patients are all resistant. And so we're seeing clustering um, of mechanism of action versus groups of patients. And so this also gave us um, kind of reassurance that, that if someone is sensitive to FLT3 inhibitors, they're sensitive to all the FLT3 inhibitors or you know, whatever the mechanism are. So, so this also, yeah, so this, uh, this was for a total of 44 different samples. So we, we also gained um, confidence with this assay. Lastly, reproducibility. So it turns out we, we thawed two different fractions of, this, of the same four patients and um, ran them twice. And this is the measurement in the first experiment and measurement in the second experiment. And my colleague, Sue and Lee, um, over in computer sciences and engineering and genome sciences, found that the sperm correlation was 0.9 with a p-value of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 141. So we thought, yes, it's reproducible. Um, so in the end, this is what we have. It's called the Cancer Drug Sensitivity Test, test Diagnostic. Um, and this is performed in a lab that's located two floors below my lab. My lab is part of this because my lab purifies the cell population. So we take in the blood or bone marrow or pleurofluid or biopsy samples or bone marrow biopsy or tissue biopsy. We're allowed to use anything and we purify those cells um, and then we hand them over in suspension at a certain concentrations that are predetermined um, for each cell type and um, bring them over to the lab two floors down. So, and we just completed our first retail patient test. I wanted to thank those in the room who might have helped me. I, when I was trying to, we were trying to order this test and I had to like prove that yes, we really did have a CLIA license and actually show that license and said, look, we really can, can we possibly get this sample um, to us? And we, we did, um, we're able to do that. And um, a miracle happened <laughs> the patient got into remission. So, um, <laughs> so anyway, so I think um, hopefully we'll have more of these folks. Um, it's quite costly right, right now. We have to, we'd have to um, be able to run a lot more assays to have it not be as costly as it is right now. So um, it's very rare that we'll find these patients. Right now I've been, all of my research um, trials have been paying for the, for the testing. Um, and now we have specific drug panels for AML or myeloma or CML um, that we are all ready to go. And um, all of them have, and these, and, and, and ALL as well, and, and those are all clear approved. Um, and this is what it looks like when I get all the results back. Um, so, um, and, and what we have is we have um, a range. So we can see how a patient fares compared to all the other patients who have been run so far. I've run like, let's say 100 patients so far in the leukemia test. Um, so, and this does not include the drug combinations, which are now part of our assay as well. There are certain issues for CLIA, as you well know. So, so part of this is that um, all this work is research and developmental. So we have those aspects, which of course CLIA would not like. So we have to like do a certain amount or numbers of things, improve every innovation before that test could become CLIA. Um, the stability of reagents and the cost of those reagents is astronomical. So it's causing a lot of addition to the cost. The standardization of cell preparation, I had to um, figure out how to, that my, I had to, the CLIA person had to make sure that my cell counts were accurate by multiple different ways. So I, I we played with that for a long time. Um, we need standard test cells, so cell lines that we keep in certain conditions to be able to test our, our uh, drugs and plates. Control plates on the um, reports and commentary, that has been quite a challenge when you have this many drugs, so it's hard for me to compose those reports. I'm not very good at it yet. <laughs> um, and then there's all these disqualifiers saying that it may or may not work. Um, um, okay, so, um, and these are just examples of some of the standard operating procedures that we have. So we have like piles of standard operating procedures in the lab that's not only, it's in my lab and in the, and in the high throughput facility. Um, QA considerations, pin, so these pins that add the drugs have to be maintained, the reagents and the lots and the shelf lives, um, the cost of the drugs. So sometimes when I want to try a new drug, like when a new drug becomes approved and I say, I ask um, Tim Martins, the head of the lab, can we get that drug? And he says, 
it's like this many thousands of dollars or it's six dollars and so it's a, certainly easier to to buy the six dollar drug multiple times than it is to, to the ones that we have to get from a pharmaceutical company for high cost um, so what about the rest of the world? So we're not alone. Um, there are testing centers in other um, countries and, and across the country. And one of the most um, impressive one, which um, this was published back in 2013, the Institute for Molecular Medicine in Finland. So I had the opportunity to visit them last August, and it was amazing. <laughs> um, every patient in Finland all these samples get cryopreserved on every single patient. So they walked me into a room which was full of humongous um, liquid nitrogen tanks. And it was probably about as big as this room full of liquid nit huge liquid nitrogen tanks with all the specimens. So they have the ability of, of testing tens of thousands of patient samples. Um, the equipment they have is superb. They have a um, piece of equipment um, which is, um, it, it's like a combination high throughput um, flow cytometer, which I need in order to kind of, there's certain assays that I need to do, but we don't have one in our facility. I can kind of use one over at the hutch, um, but they have one there. And, and anyway, so they've done amazing things. So here you can see like um, these are um, a number of drugs and a number of patient samples, and these are the mutations that those patient samples have. and. Here you can see that they even tracked each of the clones. Um, so they tracked different clones, like this clone had FLT3 mutation, this clone had a FLT3 and WT1 mutation, this clone had just a WT1 mutation, et cetera. So they tracked their clones and then they could see what happens in terms of drug sensitivity over time. And they've done really uh, an amazing amount of work and there's, they, there's many publications from there. Um, they, um, and then, South of us, um, Brian Drucker has um, on the order of a billion dollars, and he started working on this in this area a few years ago. And um, Jeff Tyner, um, whom I've met as well, has an unbelievable number of publications now. And they're running what's called the BEAT AML Master Trial with the support of the Leukemia Lymphoma Society. And this is just one of the recent publications where they looked at the um, mutations their patients had and that were um, that coexisted with the other mutations. So they've been able to profile, so the hundreds of patient samples that have come in for this trial, they've been able to do all the molecular work and all the high throughput screening work and so in, in a kind of information gathering. And then they did work like they looked at um, entisplatinib or ibrutinib, and then they looked for all the patients that had DNMT3A mutations or, or had um, NPM1 mutations or who had two mutations or all three mutations. And, and they um, went ahead and, and looked at what that range of testing looked like in terms of what did those samples look like that were being tested. So this relationship between mutations versus drug sensitivity. We've done this as well and I'll show you our data. But this is this is the level of sophistication. They have databases that are now publicly available and uh, we use them actually, my collaborators, when, um, we use them when in some of my leukemia stem cell work because um, they've made that publicly available. So, um, so those are like two of the major um, places. Um, notably, they are not purifying. Neither one of those locations is purifying. There's um, populations of cells before they test them. So they're just testing the gamish of bone marrow cells. Um, so our approach, we're, we wanted to, to do, perform a more comprehensive precision medicine um, as we went into clinical trials. So this is also known as multi-omic. So we've got genomic, we have epigenetics, transcriptome, um, which is gene expression, proteomics, metabolomics, et cetera, and then our functional testing. There's now a Society for Functional Precision Medicine, and I'll be speaking at a symposium. It's being held the day before AACR in Atlanta coming up, and I'm um, very honored to be able to go and present our work. So why AML? Um, it's a disease with easily accessible tumor. There's uh, only a 27% five-year survival, and for an, the average age of onset is 67, so um, there's only a 10%, less than 10% survival for patients over age 65, so it's a very aggressive malignancy. Um, we can identify patients who won't respond to anything, so if the initial complete remission was less than a year, then, or they had no initial complete remission, and in their, in their second to fourth salvage regimen, the expected CR rate is about 0%. 
We know patients that have good prognosis, Corbani factor mutations, or uh, I'm sorry, Corbani factor um, cytogenetic abnormalities, um, such as A21 or inversion 16 or NPM1 mutation. And patients with poor prognosis um, related to their cytogenetics or certain mutations, such as RUNX1, or if they have um, measurable um, residual disease. Um, these patients have life-threatening hemorrhages and infections, and we know that there's like the 237 recurring mutations were published by Washington University, and yet for 40 years we treated with the same two-drug regimen, and this is now still happening in the community. We have many of the patients who referred to us got their seven plus three in the community. Um, <clears throat> in terms of proving that this that this um, minimal or measurable residual disease ha matters in terms of um, significance for prognosis. Um, I'm showing a publication in the New England Journal of Medicine, um, and these are next-gen sequencing positive or multi-flow, um, multi-color flow cytometry positive um, MRD versus negative for both of those, and you can see a huge difference in terms of the chance of relapse for patients if, they're, um, if they have uh, uh, MRD versus no MRD detectable by any means. And this has been a huge effort by um, my colleagues in hematopathology. Um, and these are just a handful of the publications. There's many, many publications, and they're involved in all, in all of these aspects. So the, certainly the multicolor flow cytometry for years, and, and more recently a lot of the mutation analysis as well. Um, so our initial approach for AML was, um, this was done with my colleagues um, Tony Blau and Vivian Oler. We started with this training set of 30 patient samples. We had all the clinical information um, and finally done chromosome genomic array test. We, have, um, we had our mutation panel called My AML. We had gene expression. Um, work initially by microarrays and later by RNA-seq. And then we had custom high throughput functional assays. And we had all that data and we thought, well, if we have all this data, then we can like figure this whole thing out and like pick what drugs each patient should get. <laughs> Naive at the time. Anyway, um, <laughs> but the future. So first, like here's a purification of C34 positive cells, 99.8%. So first we use magnetic beads or can use um, facts to isolate a cell population. And then we subject it to the high throughput assay. And you can see here that um, the patient, this pa particular patient is at the lowest end, um, meaning the most sensitive um, of all the other patients tested to date for idorubicin, but um, is at the um, resistant end to the right for fludarabine. So each patient, we can test them. These are drugs we typically use in AML and we um, get all this information. And then if we um, look here, these are 24 different patients. You can see that every single patient looks different from every other patient. So this is 0.1 micromolar of all the drugs, and this is one micromolar of all the drugs. The red is dead, so there's a lot more in the higher drug concentrations. There's more red or dead. But as you can see, every single patient looks different. And yet, for such a long time, we're giving exactly the same pair of drugs to patients. Next, we want to know, could gene expression um, predict drug response, and, and could we um, look at individual genes or what genes might govern that sensitivity or resistance, and then could we make correlations and predictions? So for this, um, we developed this method called MERGE, collaboration with my um, with Sue and Lee, um, who I mentioned before in uh, at the Paul Allen School, and. Um, Sophia Selleck, who was a graduate student, has now graduated, and um, this was a computational method. So this was machine learning method to try to um, use the publicly available um, data sets to predict gene drug associations. So here the big challenge was that we have 17,000 genes, and we have, <coughs> let's say, 50 drugs that were active, and we had to somehow figure out, and the big problem there is what Swin calls dimension dimensionality, which means that we have no way of correlating with, with classic methods, the 17,000 with the 53. So what she did was she reduced that dimension by um, certain features. So there were five features that is how we got to the merge. Um, how frequently a gene is mutated in AML, the estimated impact of that gene's expression on other genes, they call that, we call that expression hubness, whether that gene is known to regulate other genes, how frequently there's genomic copy number variation and how frequently it's methylated in AML, so epigenetics. And those were the features that narrowed down the 
um, numbers of genes to, to a few hundred. And then we just were correlating a few hundred genes to the drug responses. And what we found was that um, these were the genes. There's about um, 25 to 30 of them. And they correlated. Um, red means that high expression confers sensitivity. Green means that high expression confers drug resistance. And what was incredibly cool about this, this is like the, <laughs> this is the, the um, key. Because if someone has like a high level of this is BCL2 expression, then they would have sensitivity to topo um, isomerase inhibitors, for example. And what you're seeing is that these are the drug classes and these are the individual drugs. And what's very cool about this whole map here is that, is that, is that it's going along. Like these are HDAC inhibitors. And they're all, so again, we're seeing this kind of a pattern where the same drug class we're, we're getting the same kinds of results and correlations. So this is, this now, we, we, we have validated one of the genes, the SMARC-A4. We now would have to go back and validate all of these genes. Many of these genes, we don't know what their function is because all we know is that they've been cloned in worms or yeast or something. We don't know why they would be correlated with drug uh, sensitivity or resistance. So we have a lot of work to do here. Um, our mutation analysis, so we looked at 104, 94 genes of the 237 that are known to be currently mutated, and we have all of this, this data on our, on our patient samples. And um, we, we now have a number of, of um, potential drugs for those <laughs> patients. <clears throat> and then in terms of mutations, so I collaborated with um, Kaya Young, um, who's now at University of Tacoma, runs a statistical center there. And what we found was that for patients with missense mutations, that, that we found certain genes that correlated with uh, sensitivity to clofarabine and cladribine that we use in the clinic, um, lenalidomide, mitoxantrone. And we also found for indel mutations, sensitivity for specific drugs for mutations in WT1 or TET2. So we did start to find these. This was when we only looked at 24 patients, and now I've given Kai. I'm trying to give her 58 patients worth of data so that we can re repeat this. Um, we've run two clinical trials so far. Our first trial um, was protocol 8003. This was re for relapse refractory AML based just on the high throughput screen. Our second trial, 9226, was um, based on our genomics um, data and our chemosensitivity data. And um, we treated 14 of 15 patients in the first trial. Um, we've treated 25 of these 48 patients with AML or ALL in this second trial. Our average time for results is five and a half days, and we get the mutation data within 12 days, and we started treatment within eight days. And we offered a drug to every single patient, so quite different than the MATCH trial. This is just an example of the first patient, 67-year-old, had five prior regimens, initial cytogenetics showed this, and 90% blasts. Um, and we gave the patient the drug, and his peripheral blast declined promptly. Um, marrow still showed 85% by flow. So we added drugs to the cladribine we gave him initially and got him down to 9%. And then we added a different drug that we also saw on our panel and got him down to 0.7%. So this shows you an example, a real life example, of how we were able to do this. And in fact, these were the blast responses. So for these 12 patients, um, you can see that, <laughs> that the blasts went down for each one of these patients when we gave the drugs that we chose off of our panel. And in some cases, we gave the drug, and then 100 days later, we gave the drug again, and it worked again. Or we gave this drug first, and then we gave this drug second. So, so this is what happened. This is um, preliminary stuff out of our first trial. In terms of the mutations and the inhibitors we could offer, so our, the, we found like roughly 80% of the patients, we could tailor their treatment based on what mutations we found. Um, but at the time, we didn't have the inhibitors to offer them. Now we have more of the inhibitors. So now, at the time, we only had serafinib. Now we have mitostorin and a new one called um, gilteritinib. So we have mitostorin and gilteritinib for FLT3 um, mutations. Um, we have... Um, an IDH2 mutation in a sitinib. Um, for IDH1, we now have evocitinib, and we do have some of those patients, so it's actually more than 80% we actually could, have, could offer a drug today. Um, and uh, so this was the first trial, and this was the second trial. It was um, published by Washington University that P53 mutations would respond to 10-day courses of decitabine, so that's why this made it onto the list. 
um, and we sometimes found able kinase mutations. Um, in addition, we tested drug combinations. So we had a number of different drug combinations that we would offer patients with relapsed AML, such as filirubine, um, ARC, and idorubicin, or mitoxantrin, etoposide, and cytarabine. And what we, the way we did our tests is we would test that drug alone and then in the combination, and you can see that there's this left shift of sensitivity in this patient for MEC, or in this case, ARC, they were completely resistant, 100% survival, and yet they became, in this, in, when in the combination, the combination was tested, patient is sensitive. So I would say, and I have said, try MEC in your patient when we tested all the different combinations and the individual drugs, or try FAI in your patient. And we have seen responses and remissions with those combinations. Um, so back about a year ago or so, this at that time, this is just an overview of what combinations we gave and what individual drugs we gave to all the different patients. So every different color and shape is a different drug. So this is, the, this is how heterogeneous. So we're not just using two drugs anymore. We actually offered all this stuff and gave them all to patients. The outcomes to date on um, the AML trials, so the first trial, 14 of 15 patients were treated according to our recommendation, and um, we had one patient achieve CRI, one patient achieve CR, one patient achieve CRI with additional drugs, and our overall survival is 88 days, the range up to 411. Um, our second trial, um, we treated 25 of 48 patients were treated, and we saw some, uh, half a dozen responses, plus other dramatic declines in BLAST. And actually, we haven't gone back now to add, to add in the last, let's say, 10 or 15 patients, so there may be more responses. Again, lived more than a year. Um, it was published in 2007 that anyone relapsing after an allogeneic transplant had, uh, on average, a seven-week survival, um, and, I, and we had probably 10 of these patients were post -allogenic, early post-allogenic transplant um, relapses. So we, I, to have these long survivals, one patient who had an early post-transplant relapse um, within about eight weeks, we gave 13 different regimens successively over time. And he lived to, he was able to attend his um, sibling's wedding, and you know, so, so we could get him to some life events. Um, so why aren't we doing better? Well. <laughs> Turns out there are these cells called leukemia stem cells, and they we call them the leukemia propagating cells or initiating cells. They engraft not skid mice, immunodeficient mice, and we have some markers for them. And uh, we um, thought that they might, perhaps if we tested them, we might find that they that they had different sensitivity. So we either isolated them by fax, or we or we retrieved them after engraftment of not skid mice. And lo and behold, we found that this is like ARC, and our, our, our leukemia stem cells are completely resistant, and the blasts are sensitive. And this happened in two different AMLs here, or many others, actually, or others also. Here's idorubicin, again, main drug for us. And here we see completely resistant, and yet the blasts were sensitive. So that's what the problem is. We treat the patients, and, and they kind of, they you know, look like they respond, and then by three days later, you guys see our bone marrows, they're all, they're, the, the resistant cells just grow back. And so we, we noticed this. And then we, in some cases, we saw the, a flip. Like we saw that this particular leukemia stem cell population is sensitive to gemcitabine. We never would have dreamed to give gemcitabine to an AML patient, and yet um, their blasts are resistant, but their stem cells are, are. So we learned that these classes of drugs were effective against leukemia stem cells, as well as some cancer drugs that we never would have dreamed of. And the same thing happened in the cells derived from the xenograft, where you've got this like cladribine flat line, and yet the, you know, of the leukemia stem cells, the pre-engraftment um, clone, um, and the engrafting subclone, where there's differences depending on the drug between the sensitivity and resistance. And here's that, you can see that very easily here, where you've got maximum um, degree of inhibition or minimum degree of inhibition with the engrafting subclone with the drugs we use in AML. And you can see that here too. Here are the drugs we use in AML, and here are the drugs we, that, that, that the blasts are sensitive to, and here's the drugs that the leukemia stem cells are sensitive to. So again, like completely different from each other. So our next clinical trial in AML, we're going to have um, two cohorts. One is if they are 
um, minimal residual disease positive because then we know that they're going to relapse and and so we and that's even after transplant so so we're going to look at new diagnosis patients um, take their leukemia up front and as soon as we see at day 30 they have MRD we're going to we're going to offer them what drugs we think would work and then we'll have a relapse refractory one where we're going to incorporate and for both of these we're going to incorporate the testing of the leukemia stem cells and also the gene expression so in the last few minutes, I'm going to show you about our two newer diagnoses, multiple myeloma. Um, so it turns out there's some other folks doing um, those as well. I'll show you a little bit of their data. Um, we have 175 drugs in our panel. Um, FIM has 308, Mayo has 80, Moffitt has 31. And you might say, well, well why do you need that? And, and this is why we need to test, because once patients, you know, this is the algorithm, this is a mess, okay? Because see all these different drugs and drug combinations we can use? We don't know what to do for anybody. So we're just empirically trying things, and maybe we could test the patients and try the right thing as opposed to all these different possible combinations. Um, so this is just um, this is the, the Moffitt group, and this is just showing the um, they have different patient samples, and then they have different drugs, and this is just showing the differential responses. This is the um, Finland group, and and what they were able to do is they assign different they like kind of have these fingerprints for what different the different four different groups for the way the patients behave in, in terms of the testing of the drugs versus the patients. And um, so they, they're very sophisticated in their approach, and they've been able to even group the patients so far. Um, and in my lab, we tried to figure out which matrix protein would promote drug resistance and proliferation, and that was what we used in terms of deciding which extracellular matrix to cope with. And this is 30 different extracellular matrix matrices that we tested. Um, and that led to two different clinical trials that are ongoing right now. One is to give um, all the patients panobinostat carfilzomib index and at the same time do the, the testing. And the other is to try to identify drugs to, for refractory and relapsed patients. <clears throat> so the, we're doing synergy testing, meaning we're trying to prove if there's synergy between that triple drug combination. And this just can show you that, um, so in this case, panobinostat and carfilzomib, when the two were together, we left shifted indicating synergy. Here's panobinostatin and carfilzomib for a second patient where there's left shift, but there was not here any, with panobinostatin and dexamethasone, there was no synergy in these. These were pre-study patients. Um, we can uh, create these isobolograms where you can see synergy is here and resistance is here. This was a patient that I was called, I was told by the flow lab that, that the patient, that the 15% plasma cells were not myeloma. <laughs> And interestingly, they had antagonism to the drugs we use in myeloma. So, um, and this is this is a patient uh, that we is on the trial right now, and you can see that here that patient is is uh, this is panobinostatin and carfilzomib. We see that synergy, and we see additive for panobinostatin and dexamethasone. So the goal here is to actually prove what parameters in the test are related to the clinical response, because that's what the crux of all of this is, is can you tell us how, you know, how good you are at, at predicting response. Um, this is our pick a drug trial in multiple myeloma. Um, Andrew Cowan is PI, and David Coffey is doing cell-free DNA mutation analysis for 70 different mutations. And based on that information, we're picking drugs for patients. And this is, this is our custom drug panel for our myeloma. We do magnetic beads for CD138. We purify the population. Um, and then we test. And here is an example of drugs that we use in myeloma. Again, looks very similar to AML. And this is the heat map with the drugs that we always use in myeloma. And you can see, again, every single patient. Each of these is a different patient. Looks different from every other patient. And this is our, our bigger panel. And you can, again, see every single patient looks different from myeloma as well. And lastly, um, I'll move on to CML. And what we're doing in CML is we're lineage depleting. So we're removing the T lymphocytes and the B lymphocytes and um, erythroid cells. Um, and then we're um, trying to enrich the entire myeloid population um, because uh, we don't want to um, we, we don't want to just go to C34. We don't think that that will be good enough. And this is a custom panel that we've developed um, for CML, and Pfizer's um, uh, supporting this trial. 
Um, it, it's a preclinical study. And this is just to show you what we've seen so far in CML. Again, and this is um, amongst the drugs. And we have um, the different patients that we've tested so far. We've accumulated 58 patient samples to test. Um, in addition, we're, we're doing um, uh, RNA-seq on all those samples as well, so that we hope to be able to correlate gene expression and drug sensitivity. This is a box plot showing drug sensitivity for each drug is a different, is a different color here, and it's just showing um, the spread of um, responses amongst all the patients for each drug. So some, some drugs have very narrow um, air, uh, responses, and others are very broad. In addition, we have two other trials that have broad eligibility across all cancers. So for example, um, this protocol 9673 is to develop functional screening for cancer precision medicine, and, it, and we're, gonna, we're, we're um, permitted to develop drug testing panels appropriate for each specific type of cancer. So ovarian cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer, et cetera, et cetera. And um, what's really nice about this is because our test is CLIA that once um, um, we are able to give the information back to, to patients' doctors. And then, furthermore, the, we have another trial that patients can sign that we're allowed to use their leftover samples to do research. So, um, so even when they're doing the um, part of our cancer drug sensitivity test clinically. So the future, as I envision it, is that we will have infinite drug choices and combinations. This was, um, I took this um, photograph inside one of the boxes at the Sale Art Museum's um, uh, Yayoi Kusuma. Um, it was very clever, and, and I think that, so I don't think there's just the choices on the heat map. I see this as infinity mirrors going on forever. And I work with um, collaborators at Institute for Systems Biology, so we, we need like incredible bioinformatics, incredible machine learning um, methodology with all my collaborators to try to figure this out for each diagnosis um, and all of this um, genetic and other information to be able to, to do this, hopefully in the future. So I hope I've shown you that application of rapid molecular and functional screening to choice of treatment for patients with advanced blood cancers is feasible, and that data on all of these clinical features, mutations, drug sensitivity, gene expression responses will contribute to these future algorithms to optimize precision medicine approaches to cancer therapy. But, um, these are, um, so it turns out that the Institute for Stem Cell and Regenerative Medicine leadership, um, Dr. Chuck Murray's director, and Randy Moon and Tony Blau were involved, that they decided they had the foresight to develop this laboratory. Um, and Dr. Tim Martins runs a laboratory. Um, James Annis works there. Um, Sylvia and Jane work in my laboratory. We have um, my clinical research team is in, heavily involved. My clinical collaborators in leukemia and myeloma, my Fred Hutch collaborators, um, the molecular analysis and vivo scribe collaborators. Um, we have um, Max Cheever supported our very first um, endeavor into this work on a, and our first clinical trial by the Life Sciences Discovery Fund. Um, Ray Monat, um, colleagues, um, Larry Loeb and Nancy Mizell, on his program project has enabled us to, to do some of the basic work. Um, we have collaborators both in Leukemia and Myeloma Institute for Systems Biology. Pfizer, as I mentioned, just has, has been funding CML. We have private donors who are funding the clinical trials. And I wanted to thank all the patients who have given all these samples. We have hundreds of samples now in my laboratory for testing. And lastly, being where I am, I would like to thank all of my um, colleagues who are in um, SCCA hemopathology and laboratory medicine and the various pathology departments. Um, I listed some of them. There are many more, and I just wanted to thank all of them because it's been a collaboration during this entire time of being able to make these diagnoses and, and, and think about them, and I al almost always bother them and ask them more specific details so that I could get to the bottom of every single case so that I can give the right treatment and I, and I really appreciate that um, collaboration and i um, very fortunate to be here and thank you all so much. Thank you very much. Nice talk. Um, in terms of like sort of a leukemia biology type question, so you got the leukemia stem cells, you've got the you know the blast that presumably differentiated from the stem cells. Do you think it's necessary to actually treat both components, or in principle, do you think if you could knock out the leukemic stem cells, you could take care of the whole mm -hmm. cancer? 
Yes, it's a great question. So, um, so I had to actually make that decision um, in a patient who, the patient, so the, I, I took, so it was a patient that had um, myeloid cells, and you know how these patients had myelomonocytic, so they had monocytic cells and they had myeloid cells. Um, and I took all the cells and tested them, and I got a completely different panel than when I just tested the C34 positive myeloid cells. And the question was, what was I going to do? So it turns out we chose a regimen that just hit those C34 positive myeloid cells that potentially contain the, the more leukemia stem, more primitive leukemia stem cells. And that regimen did not work in the big picture, <laughs> only the, and the patient went to remission. So I think um, what our next trial is going to do is going to be to try to choose drugs. The way I set it up is that we would choose drugs. We either choose drugs that worked for both, which there are some of those. I didn't show you a, a lot of the data, but there's some drugs that work for both, or co combine one that works for one and one that works for the other and put them together in order to try to, because right now we're trying to optimize, and then eventually I think we could randomize and, tr and prove it. But um, in the, you know, it's hard to do it all, to do everything at once. Um, the question is, could we somehow go back? And, and we've only, it's so costly, you can imagine to, it's a few thousand dollars to like screen, it's a few thousand dollars to sort, it's, I mean, we're not, not exactly a few thousand to sort, but anyway, it's hundreds of dollars to sort, it's a few thousand dollars to screen, it's a few thousand dollars. I have all the molecular um, um, breakdown in terms of the mutations, so there's only one or two mutations that we find in some, that are unique to the leukemia stem cells, and there's, like a dozen mutations in each of the of the blast populations when I compared those two, so we can see that one developed from the other. So we have, we do have all the molecular data. I didn't ha have time to show today, but we do know that at least. And I think, I think it's a great question, and and I hope to find out. So. I have a sort of a follow-on question from that. Um, so there's a lot of parallels to clinical microbiology testing with the susceptibility um, angle, and. You know, we also have microbes that eri where resistance arises on therapy, which is mostly what you've been talking about. But we also see sometimes pre-existing super rare clo clones, essentially, that might be one in a million. We don't enumerate it, but with certain techniques, we see like one colony of something in a field of tons of other um, susceptible organism. So I'm wondering, uh, when people have relapses, is it the cancer fields view that these are um, either arising on therapy or for stem cells, or is sensitivity limiting your ability to find rare drug-resistant clones that are there at the beginning? <clears throat> so, uh, Lara Loeb is back there in the corner, and we're looking at that <laughs> now. We're trying to see, because his duplex sequen sequencing method is allowing us to get down to like that one in a, you know, I don't know quite one in a million, but but much closer to to you know a much more sensitive measure versus the the um, five percent that's required for next gen sequencing or two and a half even if it's two and a half percent by next gen sequencing. So we're going to try to answer that question and try to see. Now we do know that um, in so the problem right now is that. There are all these individuals walking around with clonal hematopoiesis already. So folks are in their 80s, and they've got an 18% of them have a you know clonal have these same mutations. Um, and what a few years ago, Wang et al. from Washington University showed that 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 actually when we went all the way back, like if you if you looked at the lymph, first lymphoma um, patient bone marrow, you found the p53 mutation that later the patient when they got therapy related AML that P53, that clone had expanded. So we have some in vivo data from, from people. We know that these clones exist already. We just don't, we don't know whether we can detect the expansion of them before, di you know, before clinical diagnosis. And so, but all of that is, un is under current study. So I think that those rare clones, we know that they're there and we don't know exactly what governs the, their proliferation. The, um, it was proposed that a lot of our usual chemo is actually just killing off all the normal stuff and allowing those to expand that have proliferative advantage. If you used larger volumes in your test or ran your test longer, might you pull those out, your susceptibility testing? 
Um, so I think it would be very hard when you have a gamish, you have a mixture. So I don't think we could do it that way as well as we can do it by, like right now we're doing fax isolation. So we actually are able to sort these 1% of the population or even less. That, and we, ju we just, uh, we're, we're able to go down to as few as, we can test down to as few as, um, uh, like less than a million cells, and we can, like some few hundred thousand cells, and we can still do the testing for the 150 drugs. Yes? Just extend Sean's question uh, a bit by, Christine, do you see any difference in reproducibility between the different um, well sizes? I think you mentioned that you're most often using the 384 well. If you yeah, the we did. Plates. We had. Um, I don't know exactly what the. I could find out on um, Tim Martin's ask what happened, but it wasn't. Things didn't work as well um, when we used the other, the the smaller wells, the fifteen hundred, whatever wells. It didn't uh, didn't work as well. Um, I do use the ninety six well ones in my own lab, so that works fine. Very yeah. exciting talk, Pam. Thanks. What about the role of the extracellular matrix? Does that alter? Yes. Yes. The apparent so sensitivity. So I, I, I was going to include a slide, but of course ran out of room. But, um, but um, so what happened was for AML, we tried like two different external matrix proteins that I know one was my, actually my very first publication in blood in 1996. I, I checked, I, I published um, the role of laminin in APL differentiation. And, um, and so we looked at laminin versus the one that we normally use here. And, and then we, we, all the curves are superimposed, so the entire panel was identical no matter which external matrix. So I think once you activate adhesion-mediated chemotherapy resistance, which happens through integrins, I think that it, it was okay, you know, because all of the matrix proteins we're coding with right now are integrins. So for example, for those, for two completely different integrins that have different receptors, we ended up with the same that, you know, they must have sent, the, the FAC kinase and all that stuff, we must, same signal transduction, we ended up with exactly the same results. So there was no difference whatsoever. So that was kind of really cool. I had an um, undergraduate, UD, UW undergraduate, did that work and presented at the, the May Symposium. It's nice. Yes? One could argue that with our current state of knowledge, it would make sense in certain patients to give large numbers of different drugs simultaneously. If you argue that, what do you do about concentration? Right. So being also my, having a clinical hat on, um, so the, the issue that we have is, um, is that we typically decrease the concentrations as we combine drugs because of, um, of the issues of more toxicity. Um, however, what we were able to do in our trials is we could add those molecular inhibitors um, pretty easily onto the backbone of the chemo regimens. And we do that all the time. Like we use hypersevovad and dasatinib, or we use, we, we're adding mitostorin to um, leukemia chemotherapy treatments. So I think that there, where there's, we, we don't need to decrease the concentrations when the drugs are actually um, having um, different uh, side effects. But if they both cause um, issues with, um, this was seen with some of the antibodies to CD33, that there was just excessive myelosuppression. So I think that the problem is, is that if, it, if they have the same um, toxicities, then it's gonna be hard to add them all together. Um, and if we don't use them in high enough concentrations, they may not work. So I think those are valid concerns. Yes. Thank you, Nick. Um, so I know that there's always that moment when we test a patient after they complete their first round of therapy and you see that they have MRD and your heart kind of falls a little bit because you know that they're going to have a difficult disease course. Could this, does this assay have a place in treating MRD before transplant? Yes, exactly. So that's exactly who I'll be able to treat. So if they're not eligible, I have to defer to my colleagues, if they're not eligible for one of their MRD trials, then um, what I'll be able to do, if I, I'm going to take a sample on all these new diagnosis patients and cryopreserve it because it's too costly to, to do all the testing up front. But then once we see that MRD, we'll be able to rapidly thaw get the results within five days, um, and, and then we'll be able to suggest that they add or consider those drugs right now while there's so little disease. 
there's a logistical issue that I can't really test the MRD at the time it's MRD because there's not enough cells. So that's what part of the problem has been. Those are excellent questions. Um, I also wanted to mention that um, everybody now, so my colleague Sue and Lee now has Comba Merge. So what we're doing now is trying to figure out what are the, she has sent me a list of like 100 drug combinations that she thinks that we could use, um, that we, that she can use her gene expression to predict the synergy of these combinations. And so in my laboratory now, we're trying to figure out how can we test those theories of what, so either the drugs are theoret on theoretical basis should have good um, synergy um, for leukemia, or based on their gene expression, they have that. So we're trying to figure out ways of testing that because in future, we'll, we want to come up with novel combinations because we realize that we're very limited in what we've been able to do so far. Anyway, the hour's late. I'm happy to take more questions up here. Thank you so much, everybody. Wonderful questions.